I'm going to see one thing, you see something else. Bree and I went to Applebee's the other night, and I ordered a burger. I didn't just get a burger, I got fries with the burger. Sometimes when you get one thing, something else comes with it. When you get a car, you get an insurance bill. When I got my wife, I got cats. Sometimes when you get one thing, you get another with it naturally. And that's the way that our spiritual lives work sometimes as well. Last week, if you remember, uh, last week one of the things we talked about was what the gospel was that the gospel meant righteousness. We said righteousness is not something that we can achieve. It's not something we can earn. It's something that God gives us, and it's a blessing that he's blessed us with. So righteousness, or justification as our text today uses it, is a gift from God. But there's more to being justified than just being justified. Sometimes it means we receive other things as well. And that's what I want to see today in Romans 5. Christ's justification gives us some of the best things in life. It brings us some of the greatest things we can imagine, more than just being justified. There's more to it than that. So if you want to look at Romans 5, verse 1, today I want to look at three things that Christ's justification brings us in addition to just that justification, just that forgiveness of sins. So in Romans 5, 1, we read, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So, first thing that we have, because we are justified, we have peace. We have peace through our justification, but what exactly is peace? Well, the Greek word uh, means a quiet rest or to be set at one again. How many of you, after having a really hard week at work, you like to come home on Friday night and just sit down and rest? And you know the work week is behind you, it's done and you can just enjoy the quiet. That's peace. Who doesn't like peace? And from studying the Bible, it speaks of peace as one general concept, but I think we can divide up peace into a couple of different ideas. Uh, for example, I want to divide it up just for the sake of classifying it, just to get it in our minds there is such a thing as vertical peace, up and down, and horizontal peace. Now, when I say vertical peace, I'm talking about the peace that exists between ourselves and God. Now, uh, as far as horizontal peace goes, horizontal peace, you know, straight line, people here beside us on earth, not up in heaven. So horizontal peace is the peace that we have with other people. <clears throat> and the Bible speaks of both types of peace. Now, here's the thing about them. You can't always help whether or not you have horizontal peace. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes we can't always have, we're not guaranteed that horizontal peace. However, more importantly, here's the trick. When it comes to vertical peace, peace between ourselves and God, we always have absolute, complete control over whether or not we have that. That vertical peace is entirely up to us because God is unchanging. He stays exactly the same, and if there's something that disrupts the peace between us, it's going to be on our part. So, the kind of peace that Paul speaks of here in Romans 5 is that peace between us and God, and all Christians have or should have this type of peace. It tells us we have this peace because we are justified by Christ. When we're justified, we're forgiven of our sins. Sin is just hostility towards God. And when there's, a, when there's hostility between us, there's no peace. But when Christ forgives us, that wall of hostility is taken down and we have peace with God again. That's why Romans 8, 6 says, The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. There's peace when we live a life that's focused on God. Speaking of, you know, the fact is, we don't live in a very peaceful world. There's not a lot of peace. I actually read a study this week <clears throat> that was done by a whole bunch of smart people, including the former president of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences, and he got together with a bunch of historians from all different places, historians from Egypt and from England and from Germany and from India, and they all got together, and they tried to study war in world history, the entire world. And they compared all accounts of wars that they had in recorded history. So, saying for about... 3,600 years, that's about when recorded history started, about 3,600 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. Since then, there, have, there has only been 292 years in which there has been no war being fought. There are only 292 years out of 3,600 in which a war has not been fought. That's not a lot of time without war. It's estimated that in that 3,600 years, there's been more than 14,000 wars fought. 14,000 wars. That's more than four wars a year for the past 3,600 years. 
And it's estimated 3.6 billion people have died in wars. Since just since recorded history, that's not involving anything before that, before we started recording it. The fact is, we don't live in a very peaceful world. But a very wise person once said, peace is not the absence of trouble, but peace is the presence of God. Even though we live in a hostile world where there doesn't seem to be much peace, we can have still have some degree of peace. We can have true vertical peace with God, peace between ourselves and Him. So, because of Christ's justification, we do have peace with God, but there are a few common problems that come with this idea of peace. First off, sometimes we have peace, but we don't hold on to that peace. We allow things to get in the way of that peace. Now, I'm talking about how sin can disrupt the unity that we have with God, the peace that we have between us and Him. And, you know, that happens. Everyone sins, and Christ's sacrifice is wonderful, and that's why it doesn't matter, because God can still forgive us. However, it is possible for Christians or former Christians to get so involved in sinful practices and to be so entrapped by it that eventually they kind of disrupt the peace with them and God. If Christians have problems with pornography addictions or alcohol abuse or any other type of problem, any sort of habit that keeps going on, you can ask them, and they know in their conscience it convicts them. They know that they do not have real peace with God. They know that there's some degree of hostility there. And the only solution to that is repentance and turning away from sin and deepening our relationship with God. Sometimes we have that peace, but we don't hold on to it. We let other things get in the way. Now, here's another problem that I think is pretty frequent. Sometimes we have that peace from God, but we don't always accept that peace. We have a hard time accepting. Now, what I'm talking about is something that I think most people deal with at some point, and that's something that I call false guilt. Sometimes you feel guilty about things maybe you shouldn't. Sometimes you wonder why in the world God could forgive you. Why would God want anything to do with me after the things I've done? And that's a wonderful question that I don't have an answer to. I don't know why God would want anything to do with me after the things I've done, but all I know is that the Bible tells me he's more loving and gracious than what I am or what I understand. But here's the thing. In 1 John 4.18, we are given a solution, a, a way to remedy this sort of these feelings of worry, of false guilt that we have in our minds when we do have these problems. In 1 John 4.18, he writes, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. I think this passage is acknowledging sometimes we can feel convicted about something that is not necessarily needs to be convicted about. When we're forgiven, we shouldn't feel guilt. And so he tells us here that the solution to that is to live a lifestyle of active love. If we are actively loving each other, we know the love of God is in us. Therefore, we know that we are forgiven. We do have that peace with God. And speaking of our relationship with others, that brings me to an important point. If we have peace with God we should have peace with each other as well. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. It's a simple formula. God forgave you. You forgive others. God made peace between you and him by forgiveness. You make peace between yourself and others by forgiving them. And that's what it means to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So because we are justified, we have peace. Let's look at another wonderful thing we have because of the justification that Christ has given us. <clears throat> in Romans 5, at the end of verse 2 there, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. The second thing we have, because we are justified, we have joy. We can rejoice. Now, most translations you find say we can rejoice. We rejoice in this hope of the glory of God. But I think that could be a little more accurately translated. The Greek word there is kalkomai, and literally it may mean something more along the lines of boasting. In other words, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Well, first off, what's the glory of God? Well, at least part of God's glory is in his salvific work. The fact that he has redeemed a whole planet full of sinful people is pretty good. That means that that's, that's worth glory. He, he deserves glory for that. 
But we rejoice. He says we rejoice or we reboat or we boast in God's glorious redemption. But he also says we rejoice in our sufferings. Now James speaks somewhere along the lines of that. In James 1.12, he said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When we persevere through hardships, well, we end up receiving uh, heaven as a reward. We rejoice in hardships because we know that Christ has justified us and that it will eventually benefit us. When we suffer, it produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. So here what he is saying in Romans is we rejoice in the hope we have, and then we rejoice in the hardships because those hardships just lead to more hope. Because God has justified us, we rejoice or we boast. And it makes sense to me that those words are similar, because when someone boasts about something, it's almost kind of a way of rejoicing. That's the way that some people show their joy in something. Now, we typically have pretty bad thoughts attached to the concept of boasting. You ever known somebody who boasts about something, and they just, they just don't stop? It can get a little annoying after a while. One time, um, when I was in college, me and several of my friends were driving to Cracker Barrel. And I was sitting in the back seat with my friend Tim, and up driving in the car was my friend David. David, David is the youth minister at um, Ken Overdorf's church. David was driving. Now, David is married at this point. Tim and I were still single. I hadn't started dating Bree or anything yet. And uh, in the front seat there, riding shotgun, was uh, another friend of mine named Troy. And Troy, just a few days before, had just proposed to his girlfriend, and she had said yes. Now, here's the thing you have to understand about our college. At Johnson, being married really is kind of a status issue. It's an achievement. That's what people want. They go there. You go there to get a degree. You also go there to get married. That's kind of something that everybody there subconsciously works towards. And as they're working towards that, it's, it's almost sort of something worth bragging about because when you're married, you, curfew doesn't apply to you. You don't have to buy the meal plans. You get a nice private place to live. You don't have to live in a dorm with a bunch of people. You have more freedom. And so it's something kind of worth bragging about. And we were riding in the car, and my friend Troy, who had just, just gotten engaged, was sitting up front talking about how great it was that, uh, that he was going to get married. And he would sit there, and he would go on and talk about how great it was going to be. And they'd say something else about it. Then he'd turn around to the back seat and say, you know, throw a little jab at me and Tim about how we're still single and probably will never be happy in our lives or something. And then he would go right back to talking about how great that is. And my friend Dave, riding up front, just he's my hero. He didn't say a single word, but just riding the whole time. After listening to that for a couple minutes, he reached up. He turned on the dome line. It was after dark. He just put his hand right in front of Troy to show him his wedding band, as if to say, there's always someone better, Troy. And we all laughed at Troy about that because we knew he was being obnoxious. Sometimes when people boast about things, it's obnoxious. And so we don't always associate boasting with something good. So we're probably thinking, how do we boast in the glory of God? It's wrong to boast. But it really depends on what you boast in. You don't boast about what you do or what you've done. Second Corinthians 10.16 says, we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory, but let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. We boast about the things that God has done for us. There is good boasting and there is bad boasting. I'll give you an example. This is bad boasting. Anybody want to know what time it is? I can tell you. Because this is my new watch. It's 11.36. If you want to know again in a couple minutes, just ask me and I'll gladly tell you. This is such a nice watch, isn't it? I bet nobody in here has a watch this nice. Who has a watch this nice in here? Nobody? <laughs> you guys don't have it. Wow. You guys don't. Who doesn't have a watch this nice? This is a status issue, really. Now, that's bad boasting. This is good boasting. You know where I got this watch? My wife bought it for me as a gift because she loves me. She's such a good gift giver. She thought it would be good to wear on Sundays and... It was just very considerate of her to get this. Isn't she great? Now, wouldn't you rather hear that latter type of boasting than the former type? So he says here that we can even boast in our sufferings, and uh, we can calcomy or re rejoice in our sufferings. The fact is, sometimes things get really bad, but they never get so bad that they undo what Christ did for us when he died on the cross. And that's the reason to rejoice and boast in our God. Maybe, who knows, maybe other people will see us rejoicing, being proud, bragging about something that I haven't done, that I didn't deserve, and maybe they'll look to God as a result. So, 
Because we are justified, we have peace, we have joy. I want to look at one more thing that we have because of the justification that Christ gives us. In Romans 5, verse 5, he says, Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the, home, by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Last thing, because we are justified, we have love. Now this is something, what he's writing here is something that applies very strictly to Christians. I know that because he says it's, the love is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You don't receive the Holy Spirit, you don't receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit until you accept Christ. And so this is something that we have as Christians. Now at first reading, this may seem like this is God's love for us. There are people, and I have met people, who would argue God does not love you until you accept Jesus Christ. But that's not true. God loves us all the time. If someone gives you a gift because they love you, then you don't have to accept it. You can throw it back in their face, but that doesn't mean they stop loving you. It just means you don't receive all the benefits of their love. That's the way God's, or Christ's sacrifice is with us. But this is love that God puts in our hearts. It says he poured it into our heart. It doesn't mean I didn't have love beforehand, but this is a new type of love. This is a heavenly type of love. This isn't the feeling I get when I see my favorite food. See, God has always loved me, but when I actively accept his love, he pours it into my heart. And that means the love of God becomes a part of me. It becomes a part of my life. Our hope of heaven is going to be fulfilled because of the love that God has for us. Psalm 22, verse 4 says, In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. The fact is, in God we will not be disappointed. He will follow through. He will give us that promise of heaven. How do I know that? Well, I know it because God loves me. He's not going to bring me this far to abandon me now. I try to think of a good analogy as to what we can compare God's love to. And the best I can come up with is God's love is like a water fountain. It's like a three-tier water fountain. Can you put that next picture up there? Um, if I can explain it this way. You see, it says that God literally pours his love into our hearts. Now, from a water fountain, all the water doesn't just come up in that top tier. It comes out of the fountainhead, and it flows down into that tier. And it fills up that big bowl of water. And as it fills it up, that bowl gets fuller, and eventually it's going to get so full, it's just going to overflow and spill out down into the next bowl. And that's what God's love is. It fills us up. It, he pours it into our hearts. Now, I think that that means more than we are loved by God and therefore we have the benefits of God's love. I think there's more to it than that. It means that now we have the love of God in our hearts and we can use that love. We show people the love of God and we do that through our actions and our speech and through everything that we do. And that's what happens with the fountain. When it fills up and it overflows down into the next tier, all it does is it's, just the, it's still the water. It's not the water coming from that first tier. It's the water from the fountainhead that's filling up that second tier down. It's coming through the first tier, but it's still the same water. You see, God's love pours into our lives, and eventually it's going to overflow, and we pour it out, and we show it to someone else. It's not my love I'm showing them. I'm just a means by which God demonstrates his love to people. And eventually it's going to flow to someone else. Love, also, remember this, love in us should result in something Good. Philippians 1 verse 9 says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So, there's a lot more to Christian life than just being justified, just being in a state of righteousness. See, because we are justified, we have peace with God. And not only do we have peace with God, that peace with God should reflect how we live our lives and we should have peace with each other as well. Because we're justified, we have joy. And that joy should be something that is evident to other people and that we can spread and show other people. And because we are justified, we have the love of God actively in our hearts. And that love should overflow and go to other people and be expressed in more ways than just me feeling good about what God has done for me. Now that I have all these things, because I am justified by Christ, but I have so much more 
than just that justification. I have peace, I have love, I have joy. And there are so many great things about that. But because I have that, I can tell you, I don't want to live life without those things anymore. Because Christ's justification really does bring us some of the best things possible in life.